Welcome to another episode of Mormon Sunday School. I'm your host, instructor Bill Real. Grateful for the chance to be with you today. Today, we are going to talk about chapter nine in the Gospel Principles Manual. And the title of this chapter is Prophets of God. Now, last week it was praying to Heavenly Father, and that lesson was maybe a little dry, maybe a little boring. But this week will certainly not be the case. Hope that you enjoy today's show, and we'll jump right into it. So we, again, we juxtapose the 1979 manual with the current manual. I'm actually going to make this a little bigger uh, on the screen so that we can deal with what it is saying. And so they're going to start off by just saying, uh, essentially, first, Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And this is a scripture that's often used in Mormonism to point to the necessity of prophets, Amos 3, verse 7. And it talks about how many people in the world are in darkness, they don't have the voice of God, and that Latter-day Saints do have a prophet, and hence Latter-day Saints sing with joy, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet um, to guide us in these the latter days. And so it talks about what is a prophet. Now I want to note, first off, uh, a prophet, the idea is that a prophet is uh, one who is a special witness of Christ. And uh, there have been times in the church when uh, the church has emphasized that uh, prophets are, in fact, special witnesses of Jesus Christ, that they have, that they know with a surety that Jesus is real, they have seen him. And there is a lot of that sort of verbiage early in the church. But in recent years, I'm actually sort of surprised that the current manual still says a prophet is also a special witness for Christ because the church no longer really says that. What it now says is that prophets are special witnesses of the name of Christ. And you see up on the screen, Elder David Bednar, in a talk that he gave um, that uh, points to that idea. But this is an idea that is found uh, permutated all throughout Mormonism. When the prophets, seers, and revelators, when the prophets and apostles of the LDS Church speak of being special witnesses, uh, whenever it is in official channels, it is almost always phrased as special witnesses of the name of Christ. And as you can imagine, it's probably much easier. It requires less spiritual testimony to be a special witness of someone's name than it is to be a witness of a resurrected being himself. And so I just want to note that Mormonism seems to have, over the last 40 or 50 years, sort of distanced itself from uh, being a special witness of Christ to being special witnesses of his name. Uh, and again, you can do your own search for those things uh, to find them, but it is sort of a peculiar short, sort of shift in Mormonism. Uh, prophets, it says that he teaches truth. Prophets teach truth. Now, we're going to show later on in this. Uh, lesson, we're going to have to confront these claims. There are claims that the church makes about prophets, and then there's what the data actually tells us. And uh, we're going to show that data. And so please stay around, stick with us. I think you're going to find some of these deeply interesting. So uh, he teaches truth. He receives revelations and directions from God, from the Lord. He may see into the future and foretell coming events so that the world may be warned. A prophet may come from various stations in life. He may be young or old, highly educated or unschooled. He may be a farmer, a lawyer, a teacher, or come from any other, uh, and I've got to skip to the next page here, any other honorable walk of life. Ancient prophets wore tunics and carried staffs. Modern prophets wear business suits and carry briefcases. What then identifies a true prophet? A true prophet is always chosen by God and called through proper priesthood authority. Now, I just want to note, yes, Joseph Smith seems to have made the claim that he was called as a prophet as a young boy, and then the first few leaders sort of make their way into being a prophet at old age, and it really tends to be old age from there on forth because uh, Prophets are chosen based on the person having the most seniority among the quorum of the 12 and the 
living members of the first presidency when the prophet dies. They go back into the Quorum of the Twelve. And so you have 14 men, and whoever has the most seniority among them, which is almost always and has always been in real time, almost always would be an old man. And hence, their idea that prophets can be young or old in reality is no longer true. Any member, any prophet in the LDS church will have been an old man by the time he becomes a prophet. And the idea that a young person could be called in Mormonism's present system is, uh, to be honest, it's sort of ridiculous. Uh, It will always be old men from now on till they change the rules, until they make some kind of shift that it doesn't it doesn't hinge on who has the most seniority in the in the remaining 14 members of that hierarchy. It's going to be an old man. Um, and I just want to, again, he receives revelations and directions. He may see into the future. He teaches truth. These are things that we will tackle as we move into the lesson. So the second set of pages, we skip past these just to build read the end of that paragraph. The second set of pages uh, shows pictures of the prophets. Um, obviously, there have been less of them through 1979. Uh, But I just wanted to show, you know, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, all the way to Spencer W. Kimball. They want you to focus in this lesson manual on the modern prophets, prophets in the LDS church, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So the one on the right is color photos or images because some of those are artistic representations of those leaders because there hasn't always been uh, good photography around these leaders. But at least with the last few recent uh, half dozen or so, we're talking about photographic images of one sort or another. And President Nelson, of course, would be added to this, but he is not added into the manual. So he's not present here in these images. And then uh, I just want to note here, uh, experiences of these great men excite and and inspire us. They talk about there have been prophets since the days of Adam, Moses, Noah, and Abraham. The experiences of those Old Testament prophets excite and inspire us. Now, as we get into some of the conversation here after we get through the manual, I want to be able to hit on whether the lives of the modern prophets in the LDS church excite and inspire us. And I think the church would like us to think that's the case, but does it treat such as true, and do we as Latter-day Saints, uh, do members of the church really think such things are true? All right, so uh, it says the experience, again, great men excite and inspire us down below. Wilford Woodruff said that a prophet will never be allowed to lead the church astray. So we all get it. The manual is going to say, look, prophets are essential if we want to know God's truth. Prophets uh, have to be called by authority. It has to be done through the proper channels. Uh, prophets have to, um, prophets are responsible to listen to God. They can only teach the truth. They can receive revelations. They may be able to tell the future. Uh, but, but also one of the things that we say is that prophets can't lead the church astray. And that idea is in both manuals. So I just want to note that it is in both manuals that Wilford Woodruff said that a prophet could not lead the church astray. And it says that we should sustain the Lord's prophet. It is much greater to believe in and follow the living prophet. We should follow his inspired teachings completely. By the way, listen to the wording here. It in it insinuates blind obedience. It insinuates that we should always uh, sacrifice our own conscience to do what the prophet tells us. Like if we disagree, if we think he's wrong, if we if we have a different life experience that gives us a different perspective, doesn't matter. We should follow the prophet. Here's what it says. Uh, first, it says, it is much greater to believe in and follow the living prophet. So they're talking about how living prophets trump dead prophets. That's crucial in Mormonism because often what uh, dead prophets have taught has been disavowed and abandoned by modern prophets. Um, So living prophets, uh, it is much greater to believe in them. Then it says we should follow his inspired teachings completely. We should not choose to follow part of his inspired counsel and discard that which is unpleasant or difficult. The Lord commanded us to follow the inspired teachings of his prophet. Thou shalt give heed unto all 
unto all his, the prophets, words, and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in holiness before me. Again, the Lord will never allow the president of the church to lead us astray. And so you are being taught in this lesson that not only are prophets crucial, but you are responsible to obey them completely. And I know that apologists and um, some folks in the church will try to make an allowance here, some wiggle room. Look, we're only supposed to follow his inspired teachings. Well, sure, but when has a prophet ever came back to us and told us, hey, something I said wasn't inspired? Latter-day Saints are taught to, whether they agree with it, whether they do it or not, Latter-day Saints are taught to see their prophet as only speaking the truth, as only giving inspired teachings. And we make a little room and go like, well, yeah, but only when the prophet is speaking as such. But in real time, when the prophet speaks, you're being asked to trust that as inspired counsel. We're never really given the right tools to be able to discern when a prophet is speaking as one and when he isn't. And there are plenty of instances of the prophet himself and those who believed him being sort of fooled in the past. Okay, next. It says, the Lord will never allow the president of the church to teach us false doctrine. That is in the old manual, 1979. It's not in the new one. Here's why. It's blatantly false. We can show beyond a shadow of a doubt, absolutely demonstrable, that prophets in the past taught false doctrines. Brigham Young taught Adam God, and future leaders, Spencer W. Kimball, uh, Bruce R. McConkie as examples, disavowed that teaching as false doctrine. The uh, 19, the, the race uh, priesthood and temple ban, the racist priesthood and temple ban, uh, past leaders taught things about that, and modern leaders have disavowed it. The church, the church itself and official channels have disavowed those teachings as false theories. So past true doctrines are today's false disavowed theories. So this has been removed. The Lord will never allow the president of the church to teach us false doctrine. Well, that's what we used to believe as Mormons. We don't believe that anymore. So if president of the church can teach false doctrine and there are examples of him doing so, then certainly he will not only teach us the truth that we had back uh, in a previous uh, thing here. Uh, he teaches truth. Well, he teaches truth and he teaches error, which is no different than any of the rest of us. We also, every one of us, teach truth and teach error. And if the prophet can't discern that and he teaches truth and error, then, and, then how can we be sure that at any given moment, we're not being fooled into believing something that's untrue. All right. And then uh, we'll finish up here. <clears throat> the other thing here that is, uh, there's a big story here that's told about tithing in St. George and the newest manual just removes it completely. The story's told, but it's sort of misleading because it leaves out. And whenever this story is repeated in the church, an important part is left out, which is, uh, President Lorenzo Snow goes to St. George and tells the folks to start paying tithing, but he says, if they have means, if you have means, pay your tithing. And the if you have means has been removed in any instance where this story is told in the church because the church doesn't want you to consider whether you have means or not. It just wants you to pay tithing, whereas the prophet of the church told the members of the church if they had means, they should pay tithing. And so the story has just been taken out, I assume, just so that there isn't uh, any uh, claim in the modern church that it's misrepresenting the truth here. And so that story has been uh, removed. And then just a little last section there on the right, in order to stand, the true church must be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the, the modern church, if it's going to be built upon the foundation of truth, it must have prophets, and apostles. We must have a living prophet. All right, so now we're going to jump into some uh, stuff away from the manual, but to make a few points. The first one is, how important are modern prophets? And if we were to write down what happened in the Old Testament, the things that were great, you know, we'd have Moses parting the sea, 
We'd have, uh, you know, things that Abraham did. We had Noah building the ark. We'd have, you know, Job or whatever, all these various people in the scriptures who have had incredible experiences where God has uh, rained down fire or turned people into salt or whatever it is, right? And many of these stories would be connected to the prophets themselves, Adam, Moses, Noah, Abraham, and, uh, and all of the other prophets throughout the Old Testament. But when the church tells its modern story, it doesn't really value prophets. And here's what I mean. If we get past Joseph Smith, and we all acknowledge, even as uh, someone who's out of the church, we can acknowledge that uh, Joseph Smith is, there's a lot of things in the church that are put on him as having done that were miraculous or supernatural of some sort, uh, whether it's receiving priesthood at the hands of uh, angelic ministers, whether it is receiving visions and revelations, whether it is involved in priesthood healings and, and et cetera, et cetera. When we get into uh, the prophets past Joseph Smith, though, it's a very different story. So when you go into the LDS church and look up church history chronology, what you end up getting to, and if I just skip over to, for instance, um, 18, 1989, or sorry, 1889, April 7th, Wilford Woodruff sustained as president of the church. Then you got the 1890 manifesto. Then in 1893, President Woodruff dedicated the Salt Lake Temple. 1898, Lorenzo Snow becomes president of the church. 1899, President Lorenzo Snow receives a revelation in St. George, Utah, prompting him to emphasize tithing. Again, the wording of that isn't accurate the way it's used. It's misleading, um, but that did happen. And then you get to 18 or 1901, Joseph F. Smith becomes president of the church. 1918, President Joseph F. Smith received the vision of the redemption of the dead. Okay, so you get... Each prophet has some things happening, but then as we scoot past, you know, we get 1918, Heber J. Grant became president of the church. 18 or 1936, there was a church security program instituted. 1941, assistance to the 12 are called. 1945, George Albert Smith becomes president of the church. 1951, David McKay sustained as president of the church. 1961, under the direction of the first presidency, Elder Harold B. Lee announced that all church programs were to be correlated through the priesthood to strengthen families and individuals. 1964, observance of family home evening emphasized. 1970, Joseph Fielding Smith became president of the church. 1972, Harold B. Lee became president of the church. 1973, Spencer W. Kimball became president of the church. I just want you to notice that men are called as prophets of the church, as presidents of the church, and effectively as the prophet for the Lord. And when the church is given the opportunity to tell its story, it has practically nothing to say about these men. If you read through, you might have one change here or one change there, but at times it just runs through the leaders. 1994, Howard W. Hunter became president of the church. 1995, Gordon B. Hinckley became president of the church. They don't have anything to say about Howard W. Hunter. He was the prophet. And there's nothing special about the man. The church self acknowledges that by telling its story and simply noting the shift in the, the change in leadership without effectively telling you that that person accomplished anything as the spokesman for God. This would be the church's chance to tell that story, and it doesn't have anything to say. I also just want to note, like we already know that there are teachings in the church. We talked about them. The race and the priesthood and the Adam God are the two easiest examples to show that church leaders in the past have taught false doctrine. That's true. But it's more complicated than that. I'm going to make this full screen. And so uh, these are the various uh, changes. I'm going to actually make this a little bigger for me. Um, so what we end up with here is how things, so um, I'm, st I'm stumbling a little bit here, but let me correct myself. So what I did here is I made a list of things and I will leave this list in the show notes so that you can find it as well. But I have several lists here and this list here that we're going to go into are changes that were made in the LDS church, which would show that the church used to teach one thing and then today it teaches something else. And so exaltation as defined by the LDS church in the past 
meant that you would be like God and you would get your own planet. Today, the church officially dismisses the idea that Mormons will get a planet someday. So we used to get a planet based on the plan of salvation, and today the Mormon newsroom says Mormons in exaltation do not get a planet. Okay, number two, we were previously taught in the church that the Garden of Eden was in Missouri. Today the church claims to not know where the Garden of Eden is. Number three, the church used to instruct its leaders generally and locally to stay out of the bedroom. Then in 1982, the first presidency instructed leaders that oral sex was sin and that stake presidents and bishops should ask members about it, and then months later instructed leaders to avoid asking about it. And today, we wouldn't see that as sin anymore in the church. Number four, the church was restored or near completely, near complete as a restoration, but now we are only in the beginning of an ongoing restoration. Number five, birth control used to be taught as contrary to the teachings of the church and was related to sin in cases where the mother's health and well-being were not in question. Today, members are instructed that the decisions about birth control and the consequences of those, those decisions rest solely with each married couple. Number six, prophets taught so many things about homosexuality that have been disavowed, reversed, and abandoned. Church leaders used to teach that homosexual attraction was unnatural, that masturbation leads to homosexuality, that entering a heterosexual marriage could cure it, and that being homosexual was a choice. The church no longer holds any of these positions. And I'm going to skip around a little bit. Number nine, the church previously held that interracial marriage is sin and imposed that such is doctrine. Today, the church disavows those teachings, claiming they were false theories. Number 12, church leaders previously taught that people of color of African descent were less valiant in the premortal life and carried the curse of Cain or Ham. These members could not hold the priesthood or go to the temple. These leaders named these beliefs as doctrine. Today, the church disavows these doctrines as racist and false theories. Number 15, church leaders have taught in the past that Jesus was married and in fact was a polygamist. The modern church has distanced itself away from these teaching and teachings and no longer suggests such. Church leaders, number 16, church leaders have taught that Heavenly Father had an had actual sexual intercourse to, in order to impregnate Mary with the Christ child. The church today has abandoned this teaching. Number 19, church leaders have taught that Cain was Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Today, the church has distanced itself from this teaching. Number 21, church leaders have taught that the Book of Mormon is absolutely an ancient text. Today's church scholars and apologists are moving to a framing that acknowledges a significant amount of 19th century material in the Book of Mormon that has the Book of Mormon, at least in part, be a modern production and text. Number 23, church leaders have taught that the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is a restoration of the original text, which had been corrupted over time. In recent years, the church and its scholars have had to grapple with the discovery that Joseph Smith directly borrowed or plagiarized from Adam Clark's commentary, and many scholars in the church call the Joseph Smith translation a flawed Bible commentary rather than a restored text. Number 26, church leaders have taught that Joseph Smith was a man of honesty and integrity. In recent years, even the Gospel Topic essay on polygamy acknowledges that Joseph Smith may have, and again, the evidence seems pretty clear that he did, but the church says that he may have lied to people, including Emma, his wife. Number 28, church leaders have taught that Joseph Smith only dabbled in treasure digging and gave it up quickly. We now know that his treasure digging was pervasive and widespread and occurred over a decade. Uh, number 29, church leaders have taught that temple ordinances could not be changed or altered. Quote, Ordinances instituted in the heavens before the foundation of the world in the priesthood for the salvation of men are not to be altered or changed, unquote. But the church has seemingly, in response to how offensive and eye-opening the penalties were, and in response to how sexist the temple endowment was and other facets of the temple were in the past, have amended, altered, changed, the temple ordinances numerous times at this point. 
So why would something given from God as unalterable need to be changed? Number 31. Um, church leaders have taught ch church leaders have taught that the 1838 Wentworth version of the first vision as an isolated framing and as the only account we knew about and such portrayed that Joseph Smith's story about that vision was consistent. But now we have multiple accounts of the first vision and the 1832 account and 1835 account contradict the 1838 account in places. Now, some of these things are historical shifts. I acknowledge that. Some of these are doctrinal shifts. And, uh, you know, we ought to at least acknowledge that lots of things that have been taught as true have turned out to be declared false by the modern church. Number 33, church leaders have taught that garments have supernatural protective power. The church has officially abandoned this teaching and now holds that there is nothing magical or mystical about temple garments. Uh, number 37, church leaders have taught that Native American skin changes from dark to white as the Lamanites come unto the gospel. Uh, the church no longer holds that view. Number 38, church leaders have taught that polygamy or plural marriage is an essential doctrine that can't go away within the gospel. Uh, a few church leaders have taught that the civil rights movement was a communist plot. Uh, church leader number 42, church leaders have taught that single sisters could not take out their endowment. This is no longer the case. This was changed maybe 20 years ago or so. Uh, number 45, church leaders have taught that cremation is not the appropriate burial method and such was discouraged. The church is no longer holds that position. Um, we'll skip here to the next one. Number 51, church leaders have taught that faith to be healed was a greater faith than not having faith to be healed. The modern church teaches that faith not to be healed is now the greater gift. Uh, church leaders, number 53, church leaders taught plural marriage. The church today teaches the only acceptable marriage is between one man and one woman. Number 58, uh, church leaders have changed the definition of the law of chastity. Uh, number 60, we talked about the Joseph Smith translation. Uh, so that one I think we already covered, actually. Uh, number 61, the last one, when the doctrine of leaders being presented for a sustaining vote was revealed from God, according to Joseph Smith and early leaders, it was defined as the membership's right to consent to those specific people being leaders over them prior to their doing so. That was the doctrine. The modern LDS church has taken that away completely and made the sustaining vote simply a formality where leaders are ordained prior to a sustaining vote in conference. And rather than be a chance for members to consent to that person leading them, instead the church has switched it to a chance for members to display their loyalty to support that leader. Okay. And again, the list is 61 long. Some of them are a big deal. Some of them are less so. But if 20 of them are a big deal in terms of really significant doctrines changing and those doctrines uh, essentially being abandoned or reversed or done away with in one form or another, it speaks to the idea of whether prophets really do have the ability to speak to God or does the church just make changes when those changes are necessary uh, and that speaking to God really isn't a part of this. So there's that. Okay, and then here's another list that I've got. In this list, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this take up the full screen too, so that folks can see it. And then I'll just note here, uh, this list is about the dishonesty of leaders. And so I have documented here numerous instances where the church has lied. So number one, uh, the SEC scandal, where the church created dummy companies approved by the first presidency in order to hide from members in the general public. How much money they had. Number two, Joseph Smith cutting out the 1832 first vision account and storing it away in the historian's uh, vault, church historian's vault. Number three, the Council of 50 as a secret organization that was, uh, that was at least in part based on violent rhetoric, that they had bound themselves together in a secret group um, and had made promises of, of violence. Number four, uh, and, that, and by the way, that Council of 50 being unaccessible to the membership for over 100 years. 
Uh, and only in recent years has the church finally released this in an effort to be more transparent. Number four, Ronald Pullman gave a conference address in 1984. The church had him redo it and then sent out the redo on the VHS tapes. And you can still go on Google, on I'm sorry, on YouTube today, and you can watch the side-by-side of both talks. And it was quite deceptive that the church replaced it, even adding a cough track to the redo uh, in an empty conference center so that people would think it was the original. Again, when you're led to believe something that isn't true, you're being deceived. And the church, there's no way around it. The church was very deceptive in what they did in regards to that talk. Number five, prior to the release of the gospel topic essays regarding polygamy around 2015, church members were never taught in official channels that Joseph Smith was a polygamist, nor were they taught the circumstances of his polygamy, such as teen brides and the marrying of his wives, marrying the wives of other men, nor the pressure that Smith placed on these young girls and women to enter these relationships. Number six, the church pushed a narrative of Joseph Smith using the Nephite spectacles to translate the Book of Mormon. Meanwhile, all that time having the seer stone in their possession and not telling members about the stone in the hat until recent years. Number seven, the church always taught in regards to Joseph Smith's treasure digging that it was not prevalent, and yet it was. Um, Number eight, until the recent changes in 2023, members going through the temple for the first time were given a chance to leave the ritual if they did not want to make the covenants that they are, that were about to be extended to them. But this is not how informed consent works. They were not informed about what they were about to get into. In other words, the church wanted you to make a decision with a very limited understanding when it could have easily given you enough information that you could have made a choice that was based in informed consent, and it didn't. Number nine, the church has withheld from official sources the significant event of B.H. Roberts, well-known and respected 70, presenting to top leadership what he saw as the weaknesses and contradictions in Mormonism's truth claims. So that meeting that B.H. Roberts had as a 70 with the top 15 leaders presenting the weaknesses in Mormonism's story has been avoided by uh, official channels of history uh, that it's been a limited understanding or limited telling of that story so as to manipulate people into not really understanding what happened with B.H. Roberts meeting with church leadership. Uh, the existence of the Danites, that's always been something that's been denied and uh, sort of distance, the church's distance itself from acknowledging uh, Joseph Smith's numerous run-ins with the law, many of them very credible situations where Joseph had legitimate charges. He wasn't always just hauled away on quote-unquote trumped-up charges. Uh, in 1886, the Mormon settlers in Circleville detained and disarmed a group of Paiute Indians and then committed major atrocities on Native Americans in various moments around those, uh, those decades in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And uh, that has been sort of obscured in Mormon history. Um, blood atonement has been denied as a teaching of Brigham Young. You can see number 14 there, Joseph Fielding Smith denies it. Uh, but today we absolutely clearly understand that Brigham Young taught blood atonement. Uh, number 15, uh, the church avoids disclosure and conversation around Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, early quorums of the 12 having ownership of businesses that sold alcohol, including Brigham Young's whiskey distillery uh, and the Leverkin winery. So there's that. Okay, number 17, treating the proclamation on the family as if it was a revelatory document when it was really created to be an amicus brief, a friend of the court and was written by uh, lawyers in order to accomplish that. Uh, number 18, the Brigham Young Teachings of the Presidents of the Church Manual was highly revised so as to edit out any reference of Brigham Young's polygamy so that wives were changed to wife. And it was in order to deceive uh, members. Excuse me, I had to pause that and sneeze so that you didn't hear that. But let's go back to the... Uh, to the uh, program here, but the, 
the wording in the manual is uh, revised so as to deceive members into thinking, if they were reading along, that Brigham Young was a monogamist. You wouldn't know any better. Um, all the various places where the church has uh, said things on race, uh, for instance, number 20, there's a question about a reporter's article that states a Mormon belief. It seems the Mormon church teaches that Negroes have inferior souls. Joseph Smith gets all indignant and uh, indigenous and insisting that the reporter has no clue what Mormons believe, writing that Mormons have no animosity towards the Negro, neither have they described him as belonging to an inferior race. This just isn't true. And that's not true. I mean, the church absolutely, on multiple occasions, taught that the Negro race belonged to an inferior race. Um, so again, we have church leaders lying. Uh, the changing of the Book of Mormon's title page to alter the phrase literal descendants to among the descendants, the changing of the phrase in the Book of Mormon from white and delightsome to fair and delightsome. Again, these are reversals. These are places where uh, the church never comes forward and tells the full story of why it did something. Um, number 27, the church hoarding billions of dollars. Number uh, 31, the church in its rhetoric and artwork insinuated that Joseph Smith worked directly with the plates when translating the Book of Mormon. This wasn't true. The plates were either covered or not in the room at all. Um, and I can go through more of these. Uh, Russell Nelson has been uh, deceptive about very uh, personal stories in his life, and those haven't been represented fairly. Number 41. 42, 43. Elder Holland has been dishonest on several occasions. Number 40, number 39, number 38, number 37. Um, you know, the church tells the story. Number 46. The church tells the story of Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner saving the Book of Commandments in her dress as the mob is trying to destroy it and all the pages are blowing around outside. But what they don't tell you is that Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner was a was uh, um, approached by Joseph Smith when she was 12 years old, and he told her that at the age of 12, he told her that someday she'll be a plural wife of his. And in fact, at a later date, she did in fact become a plural wife of Joseph Smith. So the church doesn't tell you that the person you're learning about in this story was a wife of your founder, but chooses to only tell the stories about people's lives that build faith that don't bring about questions, that don't sow seeds of doubt. And so here we go, 48, 49. Uh, now we're in the 50s and 60s. Uh, again, 59, Spencer Kimball and Bruce R. McConkie both deny that Brigham Young taught the Adam-God doctrine. Uh, number 62, Wilford Woodruff lied with the 1890 Manifesto as the church simply went underground with the practice and continued to authorize polygamous marriages even after the 1904 Second Manifesto. Uh, leaders lied again in uh, 1936 about uh, the 1886 revelation by John Taylor. Uh, number 67, the marriage by Joseph Smith to Helen Mark Kimball, who was sealed to Joseph Smith several months before her 15th birthday was done to obfuscate the fact that she was 14 and a half years old so as to downplay her being a child. Uh, number 69, Doctrine and Covenants section 8, changing from the gift of working with the sprout or rod to the gift of Aaron in order to distance the church from Joseph Smith's treasure digging. Number 73, the second anointing is a super secret special ordinance that only a few receive. You have to be nominated by one who has already received received it and is mostly reserved for mission presidents, a few stake presidents in the upper leadership of the church from 70s and up. It is so secret and forbidden that the teaching manuals, that when teaching out of the teacher's manuals, the manuals explicitly say, do not attempt in any way to discuss or answer questions about the second anointing. Um, and, and there are others too, but here's 74, 75, 76 uh, various instances of the church being deceptive or flat out dishonest and lying. 
And so folks, what we get to at the end of this is we all have to sort of wrestle with uh, whether prophets, whether prophets are what the church says they are. Do prophets only teach the truth? No, they absolutely have taught false doctrines in the past. Are prophets in the modern church, are they, could they be old? Could they be young? Could they be from any walk of life? Mm, not really. It's going to always be old men. You can bet me however much you want, but the next hundred prophets of Mormonism will be old men. Um, and you can take me up on that if you'd like. In fact, let's just say the next, uh, over the next 30 years, hoping that I'm alive that long, would any of you like to venture that, the uh, prophet who leads the church, that there will be one under the age of 55. There won't be. And almost certainly, almost all of them will be men uh, in their late 60s. And again, most of them will be actually in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And, th and the church actually just keeps getting older and older as far as the leadership goes. Th they don't teach the truth all the time. They teach false doctrines. They're, they are old men. They're not really necessarily from any walk in life. Um, we can say they can receive revelations and directions from God, but it actually looks a lot like a corporation being run. There's actually very little uh, direction coming forward in this church that other churches couldn't claim the same sort of thing as revelation. Uh these men often have issues with their honesty or credibility. Again, I demonstrated that at least in part with those lists. I would suggest you sit down with those lists and read them at, at length to kind of understand all the directions I was going with those. Um, but you're going to have to decide, do prophets in the modern church, are they really like Moses, Noah, and Abraham? And if so, could you name could you name the, the revelations these men have given? Could you name the things these guys have given that show that these men were talking to God? And then are you willing to weigh that against the things that they've gotten wrong? And then I think it just raises a really significant question about how trustworthy prophets in the modern church are. So I will leave you to wrestle with that. Um, if I said in the last 20 years, what revelations have you received that indicate that the LDS prophet speaks directly to God and gets instruction from him? And I think that list wouldn't be very powerful. It might be the same kind of list, the same sort of magnitude of directions given that the head of the Methodist church, the, the council that leads the Baptist, um, the, the folks at the top leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It would be revelation of that same sort. And so, folks, I'll see you guys next week. But in this instance, you have to wrestle with what are prophets of God and are the men in the LDS church who uh, carry the title of prophet, are they like Moses, Noah, and Abraham? Do they teach the truth? Are they trustworthy? And are they the best source? of truth that we should uh, tie our lives to. Uh, have a great day.